So I want to um, do a lesson now. I'm going to call this Paradigm Shifts, the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, and sort of Enlightened Despotism. But really broadly, um, we're really going to be talking about one of those big picture things that is a way to analyze a whole lot of history. Um, so, um, so we're going to start here with sort of the story of the scientific revolution, but also of a philosopher in the 1960s who tried to make sense of all that. So we got to open with our science of the ancient world. Now, in this ancient world science, the Greeks were brilliant. They had these amazing ideas, but ultimately um, they're, um, they were wrong about a lot. So they had a lot of philosophy, a lot of history. They just were not as strong in science as they otherwise could be. So for example, their guy Ptolemy believed in the geocentric universe with the earth at the middle. Because if you looked up in the sky, that's what you saw. Um, and then um, the other real foundational thing for them was that they felt that in terms of elements, everything was composed of four things, earth, air, fire, and water. And you could figure it all out just by that. And that different proportions made up what happened. So for example, smoke, because it had more fire in it, rose because fire rose. And heavier things like fell because they had more earth in them. Um, and this led them to what was, it, it, it's called the Aristotelian view of science, but others practiced it as well. And it basically works like this. You are just, you, you just know. So Aristotle and other Greeks came up with that hypothesis about the four elements. And Ptolemy came up with, um, you know, the geocentric universe. And there was no need to experiment. We just knew because we just knew that's how it was. Now, this view of science where you didn't need to experiment dominated for 2000 years. And really up until the scientific revolution, that was just what you did. Um, we're going to demonstrate a little bit of Aristotelian science, and this is how um, the ancient Greeks viewed the world. Now, to do this, I put on my uh, lucky baseball shirt with baseball season starting. And of course, as you can see, it says Sandberg on it, so instant Halloween costume. But um, the way the Greeks viewed the world was there were everything in the world was composed of four things, earth, air, fire, and water. And different substances had different proportions of those four things. So for example, they felt that men being more cool and collected had more earth in them and women being hot tempered and volatile had more fire. So I'm going to show you how the Greeks uh, postulated things. And this is how Aristotle did his science. You come up with your hypothesis and then you basically just are a smart guy. You figure it out. You never need to experiment. So Aristotle basically said that the heavier object, our heart-shaped rock here, is going to fall faster than this uh, plastic duck, not that the Greeks had plastic, but because the rock has a lot more earth in it and it wants to get closer to its earth friends. So he didn't need to do the experiment we're gonna do because he was just a smart guy. So I'm gonna drop these and you can think about what would happen. So. According to Aristotle, this rock is going to fall faster. And remember, he never did this experiment. Okay, one, two, three. So what you can see, of course, is that the rock fell just the same speed as the light duck. Must be, who knows, maybe the duck has more earth in it. But ultimately, it was Galileo that figured out that that system was wrong. But it shows the difference in what led to the scientific revolution is people being willing to experiment. Um, now, let's then, that sets our stage. Now, we're going to move over then to UC San Diego in the late 50s, early 60s, where you had a guy named Thomas Kuhn, really famous um, professor on the history of science. But his thing was, was trying to figure out, okay, um, where 
why could people like Aristotle and Ptolemy, I mean, Aristotle is like one of the founders of Western philosophy. Ptolemy was a brilliant like mathematician and astronomer. How could they just be so wrong? Like smart people, how can they just be so dumb? And he puzzled on this actually for several years. And he eventually comes up with the idea that he was looking at it the wrong way. And this is his big insight, which carries over to a lot of other disciplines. He basically realized Aristotle wasn't wrong from his point of view. Empirically, of course, he was wrong, but he didn't know that. He just had a different way of looking at the world. And the word um, Kuhn uses to, to come up with that is a paradigm. So what is a paradigm? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. His ideas made sense in the context of this view. And so that um, is what it was. So if you understood how Aristotle saw the world, that's what mattered. So in 1962, uh, Kuhn writes his book. I had to read this for grad school. It's a fascinating read. It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And again, his key insight is this whole idea of paradigms. Well, what does that mean? So a paradigm is a set of beliefs that is so foundational to someone's view of the world that we just don't think to question them. They are just how it is and how we know how it is. And so you say, well, you're operating under a certain paradigm. Maybe you've heard this word before, maybe you haven't. So some examples of paradigms today that we just work under, we need to have letter grades in school, A, B, C, D, F. Okay, that is just a paradigm that we have. Another one I didn't write down here, but taking the SAT to get into colleges, okay? Um, another paradigm in America we have is democracy is the best form of government. We may ask that question in a little bit, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and then to understand people from the past, you have to understand their paradigm and how they viewed the world. So to understand Aristotle, it was mostly important that you understand his, um, you had to understand that he was looking at it from those four elements. Okay. And so um, more or less, that was his thing. So Aristotle wasn't wrong, but he just had this earth, air, fire, and water paradigm that he had to deal with. And, um, you know, Ptolemy, based on what he had, the geocentric universe made sense. So there's a cover of one of the editions of his book. Interesting read, should you want to pursue this more. Now, this is really how his basic model works. And he laid this out for scientific revolutions, but it maybe applies to other things. So in, when people are working under the original paradigm, Okay. You would say that um, that's just how they view the world. And then any research conducted under that paradigm, Kuhn called normal science. Okay, So this is just the everyday stuff working under your assumptions. Now, as things go on and you know instrumentation gets better and the equipment gets better as science progresses, people will begin to notice anomalies or anomalies in the paradigm where the data doesn't quite match up. This is what was happening with astronomy in the, you know, 14, 15, 1600s, whereas telescopes got better and math got better. They were noticing, you know, the system, it's not really working. And I can show you um, how they um, accounted for that. So then what will happen is you, it's called extraordinary science where people will begin to try to accommodate, you know, new additions to the paradigm without throwing it out completely. So for example, in the geocentric universe, here's what they did. So they still felt that here's the earth. I'm going to draw a terrible E here, but so the earth was at the center of the universe. And then of course, everything rotated around the earth. But what they noticed was based on the math and where the planet should be, they weren't quite where they needed to. So if like say this was uh, Jupiter, if Jupiter was supposed to be at a certain place on like April 26th 
and it wasn't, it was here. Well, how do you account for that? So they ended up with coming up with something called epicycles. And so the basic idea was something like this. So that as Jupiter went around the Earth in the middle here, it also did these backflip circles and it was going around this way. And so the epicycles made the math work, but it doesn't mean it was an elegant system. And as science got better, they kept having to add more and more epicycles. Now in Kuhn's model, what then happens is that eventually someone is going to say, you know what, this whole epicycle thing, that's just baloney. And we need to come up with a new system that explains things so much better. And that is what's when a scientific revolution happens because somebody will create a new paradigm. So this is what you're going to read about. This is what Nicholas Copernicus did, where he tossed out with the epicycles and said, you know what? we will have a uh, heliocentric model or the sun's at the middle. And the only thing Copernicus got wrong was just that um, he had the orbits as circles, but in reality, they are e e um, el elliptical or ellipses and they're oval. And that's what Kepler figured out. So then a new paradigm arises and eventually people will accept it. And then the new paradigm becomes the way you do things. And then you go back to normal science until such time as um, more anomalies will arise. And then you will end up with another scientific revolution. So that's uh, more or less the model. Okay, so where does that leave us? So this is a slide I just put in here and I will post this uh, PowerPoint. This just lays it all out on um, what I was saying, but I thought the illustrations worked better. So that's what you can see here now. So, okay, that's great. That applies to science. What are the implications of this point of view? Well, this is where it can be a useful tool. doesn't mean it's perfect. Now Kuhn felt his model was specific to science. But others, remember this was the 1960s with a lot of uh, rule breaking, others began to use it as a lens to apply to other fields. So what else could this apply to? So basically these other uh, broadening this model, if you want to understand why people did certain things, you first need to understand their paradigm. So for example, um, how could Europeans justify slavery? Well, because their paradigm was that that was okay. And during the 1400s, you could argue the paradigm about race was beginning to change because of who they were encountering in, you know, the Western hemisphere. Okay. Mercantilism was a paradigm, which basically said, well, the country that dies with the most gold wins. So the goal of colonies is to produce raw materials for the mother country. That's why Spain was pillaging silver and gold out of North and South America, especially South America, because the paradigm of mercantilism is what guided them. If you want to understand how could somebody like Adolf Hitler do such terrible things, well, you got to understand that Hitler viewed, you know, uh, history as the struggle for different racial groups for superiority. Um, I didn't write this one down, but Karl Marx felt that all history was the study about social classes and understanding those conflicts. But if you want to understand those people's point of view, that's how um, you do it. Now, if you take this to its extreme, you could ultimately argue there's no truth. You just have a different paradigm. But that takes you down a really scary place because ultimately there is, you know, the, you, know you, you do want to have truth. Um, and where it can get scary is um, if you, you know, again, take it to that extreme. So um, where does that leave us? Well, okay, there certainly, of course, is, you know, right and wrong, but nobody ever thinks they're wrong. And I know I've said this in some other talks too, but because no one ever thinks they're wrong, they have to justify what they do. And you ultimately can come up with a paradigm um, about that. Now, another uh, feature that I kind of glossed over before is that when the paradigm begins to shift, 
Okay. Whatever it is, whether it's shifting away from mercantilism or, you know, ideas about slavery, people resist changing that paradigm. People don't like to be told that things aren't going to be the way they've always been. <laughs> and so that's very often when you see mass hysterias in a time of changing paradigms. So you could argue even in America today, for example, that you know, because white people are not going to be the dominant group, that's going to change things. So that um, takes us to the end of our talk. But hopefully you can use this model as you read and study history to apply the idea of paradigms to a lot of other history. And you can even look for paradigm shifts. And as a hint, this may be one of your final exam essay questions.